welcome back yet again to another day of The Girl with the Silver Eyes by Willow Roberts, or Willow Davis Roberts. I almost reversed her name. I feel bad. Um, yesterday, if you remember, Katie did a little bit of snooping, which I guess is unethical, but I, I have to admit I did my fair share as a kid. So, um... I wouldn't recommend snooping because if you get caught, it can always be a bad thing. But in this case, Katie did learn the names and birth dates of the three other kids that were born around the same time as her to the women that were working with her mother at this suspicious pharmaceutical plant. She also attempted to scare off the new babysitter, but it doesn't seem like it worked because the woman is completely oblivious to her anything but the TV. Well, at least until her wig fell off. <laughs> so let's jump back in to Chapter 6 of The Girl with the Silver Eyes by Willow Davis Roberts. She would have gone through the telephone book immediately, looking for the other names if it hadn't been for the sitter. Mrs. G. had turned down the volume on the TV and was now talking on the telephone. To get to the phone book, Katie would have had to approach within inches of her, and she didn't feel like doing that. Little skinny kid with glasses, Mrs. G. was saying. She paused and held her hand over the receiver to speak to Katie. I'm talking to my sister. Why don't you go outside and play or something? She lifted her hand and continued the conversation. It's a long way over here on the bus, and I don't know if it's worth it for babysitter money, and I almost starved with the little that they kept in their icebox. Indignant, Katie turned away. Fortunately, she had just remembered that she had Mrs. M's receipt for the paper, and she decided to take it there and see how Lobo was. Mrs. M opened her door wearing a moo with lavender and white flowers against a deep purple background. Well, come on in, she said, opening the door wide. You back for more books? No, I, I mean, yes, I, I did read both of them, and they were good, but I forgot to bring them. I just wanted to get away from my babysitter and give you this. She handed over the receipt and then noticed Lobo rot lying on a red velvet cushion at one end of the couch. How are you, Lobo? It happened again. She knew as certainly as anything. Katie turned to Mrs. M. He feels better, and he wants some chopped liver. Mrs. M. laughed. Oh, you can talk to cats, huh? Well, maybe you can. He definitely had a bladder infection, just like you said, and he should be better, taking medicine that costs $12.50 for a tiny little bottle. All right, love, she said to the cat. I'll get your liver. While she was getting it, she talked to Katie over the top of the refrigerator door. Why do you need to get away from the sitter? She's terrible, Katie said. She almost added that the woman was fat, but decided against it. Mrs. M was pretty big, too, but she wasn't terrible like Mrs. G. She's got a whole pile of banana skins and apple cores on the floor next to her chair, and her coffee t cup has made marks all over the table, and all she does is watch TV, except now she's talking to her sister on the phone, probably long distance, and on our bill. Sounds like a good one, Mrs. M said. You want a cookie? The cookies were oatmeal and raisin and homemade. Katie chewed appreciatively. She wondered if Mrs. M would have any ideas on how to find where those other kids, born in September almost ten years ago, were. She knew that she was taking a chance, but she had to find those kids. And if Mrs. M didn't get excited about Katie talking to cats, why, maybe she would understand other things, too. Before she knew it, she was telling Mrs. M the whole story. How other kids didn't like it when she made the ball move away from her face, or whisked back a pencil without touching it, or got her shoe when two boys were tossing it back and forth between them by just mentally pulling it down. Mrs. M seemed very interested. 
She poured Katie a glass of milk and made herself some tea and put a plate of cookies between them on the table. It, it's not just that I can move things, though, Katie said, reaching for her third cookie. It's something in my looks, because a lot of times I haven't even done anything, and they just look at me and back away. It's your eyes, Mrs. M said, nodding. They're very different. People don't like people who are different. But why? Katie asked. Having silvery eyes doesn't hurt anybody, does it? No, not really, said Mrs. M. Not any more than having one blue eye and one green eye does, but the other kids tease Jackson Jones about it. They make dumb remarks. My brother, he had a birthmark right here, and she touched the side of her face. It was kind of shaped like an insect, and all the kids called him Spider Face. After he got grown up, he had it taken off, but people who have known him a long time, they still call him Spider. You can't have your eyes taken out, Katie said. No, but I think maybe you can get contact lenses when you grow up. They can make it seem as if your eyes are a different color, if that's what you want. Really? But it'll be a long time before I've grown up, and even with contact lenses, I'd still be different, won't I? Mrs. M shrugged. It seems to me that you're better than most people. And maybe that's it. They don't want anyone to be better or smarter or more powerful in any way. They're afraid of people who are different, so they make fun of them, attack them. It's foolish, but it's the way people are. So what else can you do other than make things float in the air? Katie shrugged. Nothing. And it's not very useful. I mean, it's easy to make the pages of my book turn without touching them. But it doesn't save enough energy so that I can use it to do something important. And it's easy to bring myself a banana from the kitchen without getting up and going after it, but it would just take, like, a minute to do it the regular way. Mrs. M thought for a moment. Well, you said it's getting stronger. You can move heavier things now than when you first started, so maybe there will be a use for it one of these days. But why do I have to wait till I'm grown up? Katie asked. And won't I still be a freak? Won't people still be afraid of me and hate me because I'm different? I don't know any grown-ups that can make things move by thinking about it. Mrs. M nodded her uncombed, messy head. It's a problem, all right. Let me see you move something. Can you put sugar in my tea? I don't know, Katie told her. Sometimes I spill things if they're not in a package. We could clean it up. Go ahead, put some sugar in my tea, Mrs. M told her. So Katie lifted the spoon from the sugar bowl and floated it unsteadily across the table and dumped it triumphantly into the teacup. She only spilled a little into the saucer. Hey, that's very good, Mrs. M laughed. I wish I could do that. It seems like it would come in really handy, especially when you get old and stiff or when you're sick. I can see, though, that it might cause trouble if people see you doing it when they don't understand. I think my grandma thought I was a witch or something. It scared her. And I didn't even do that many things in front of her. Well, all you can do is be careful and just not do it when anyone's looking. Yeah, that's what I do mostly now, Katie said. But maybe, if there are other kids like me, I could find them. It would be nice to know someone like me. So she went on and told Mrs. M about Nathan's theory about something happening to the women who were pregnant when they worked with the drug that was so dangerous that the company stopped making it. Do you think that's possible? Katie asked when she was done with the story. Mrs. M thought for a moment. Well, I've read about such things. I mean, I thought it was science fiction. But 20 years ago, men going to the moon was science fiction, and now they can do it. And if it happened to you, it seems like it could happen to someone else. Not going to the moon. I mean, making things move by themselves. 
So maybe there's a lot of people out there like you. Only maybe they've been treated like freaks, so they've gone underground. You know, they're pretending to be some the same as everyone else. It's hard work pretending all the time. How am I going to find them, though? Katie wondered. She brought out the three birth announcements from her pocket and tried to smooth the creases. I already looked in the phone book for the name Lamont. There aren't any at all, so I guess they moved away. What about the other names? Mrs. M had to get out her reading glasses to look at them. Eric Arnold Van Alzerberg, born to Paula and Richard. Dale John Casey, born to Sandra and Alfred and Carrie Louise Lamont, born to Fern and Charles. Hmm. Katie waited hopefully for Mrs. M to come up with a great idea, but all she said was, get the phone book. We'll at least look up the other ones. Although there were no Lamonts, there were 11 Van Alzebergs, although none of them was named Richard, and 17 Casey's. Two of the Casey's had the first initial of A, so they decided to try those first. Neither answered. Mrs. M looked at the clock. Well, they must all still be working. You'll have to call at night. With Monica and Nathan listening, Katie said, how am I going to do that? I guess you could come over here and use my phone, Mrs. M said. If they had kids, Katie said. Wouldn't someone be home during the day? They might leave them with a sitter. Speaking of sitters, do you think that the one you had today will be back tomorrow? I don't know, Katie told her. She said it was a long way to come and didn't pay enough. Maybe Monica will fire her. Katie hopes so. I can do more things to make her quit, but if I do, Monica and, and Monica and Nathan find out they might do something to me. I don't think they'd be as understanding as you've been. I've been around longer, Mrs. M said. The more things you see, the more you learn to accept things. I guess we probably should not eat any more cookies. They'll spoil your dinner. I suppose, Katie said. It's almost five and everyone will be coming home soon. In fact, Mrs. G has to catch the bus at ten after, so I don't even know if she'll be around until my mom gets home. I think I ought to see if there's any way I can help Jackson Jones collect from Mr. Pollard. He said that he always makes Jackson come back three to four times before he pays him. I'm not surprised, Mrs. M said. Mr. Pollard hates cats. He kicked poor Lobo once and Lobo limped for a week. And nobody who hates cats is a good person. Mrs. M sounded interested as she said, what are you going to do? I don't know, Katie told her. I'll just have to wait and see, I guess. She went back to her own apartment, going by way of the deck to see if anyone was swimming. Nobody was. What was the point of having a swimming pool if nobody swam in it? Mrs. G had finally turned off the TV and was picking up her garbage to take it to the kitchen. Katie was disappointed. She had hoped it would still be there when Monica came home, so Mrs. G would get fired. Well, see you, kiddo, said Mrs. G after she dumped her dirty dishes in the sink and the rinds, cores, and peels into the trash. I'll see you tomorrow. It was ridiculous that Monica was paying a woman to come here and watch TV and eat their groceries. She hadn't paid any attention to Katie at all. She hadn't even asked where she had been for the hour or more she had been gone. How good was she? Katie stood on the balcony and watched unhappily as Mrs. G tottered off to the corner to catch her bus. She was intending to come back, and what could you do to frighten off somebody who was so absorbed in soap operas that she didn't notice what went on around her? Suddenly, Katie remembered the meatloaf and potatoes she was supposed to have put in the oven. Katie ran to the kitchen, turning the oven on and getting out the meatloaf that Monica had made the night before. Usually, you bake those things at 350. Would it cook faster if she turned it up to 400? She stuck the meatloaf in and got out the potatoes. 
Back when she was younger, Grandma had put big, clean nails through the potatoes to make them cook faster. But Katie couldn't find any nails in Monica's kitchen. Well, they'd bake at 400, too, and maybe it would work out okay. Maybe she should turn it up to 500? She could turn it back down just before Monica got home, and they'd never know the difference. She went back out to the balcony, waiting for people to show up. Someone did, though she didn't know who he was. He looked to be about the same age as Nathan, only she liked the way he looked better. He didn't have a beard, and he had a nice, friendly face. He parked his car in the space for 3A, which probably didn't matter, since Mr. P didn't have a car, and came towards the front door. When he looked up, looked up and saw Katie, he waved. The new man was tall and had sandy hair and blue eyes. Katie was very conscious of eye color now. She kept hoping she would find someone that had silvery eyes like hers. Of course, this guy was much too old to have been exposed to the experimental drug or whatever, but maybe that wasn't the only thing that gave people abilities. Hi there, he called up to her. Do you know if there are any furnished apartments for rent in this building? I'm looking for one. Katie leaned over the rail. I don't know. The sign says furnished and unfurnished. My mom rented this one unfurnished a week ago. The manager lives in the basement, though, if you're looking for him. Okay. He grinned and went inside. It would be nice, Katie thought, if Mr. Pollard moved out and this guy moved in. He didn't look to be the type that would swear at her if he ran into her on the stairs. She saw Jackson Jones coming on his bicycle far down the street. There was a little dog running after him, barking and nipping at Jackson's leg. She could talk to cats. Could she talk to dogs? From a block away, she wondered. She didn't know if she would have to say it out loud enough for the dog to hear it, but it was worth a try. Stop that, she said. Jackson's a nice boy. Don't bite him. Of course, the dog couldn't hear her. But it did suddenly stop running after Jackson and trotting back to its yard. She didn't know if she had communicated or if the dog had just gotten tired. That was something most other people couldn't do either, talk to dogs and cats. Well, I mean, anybody could talk to them, but most people didn't get answers back. Not that she had had an answer from the dog, but he had done what she said. She wondered what old Dusty would have had to say if she had been able to get him to respond. Dusty had been an old dog, though, when she went to live with Grandma Welker, and he had had to go live with the Tanners after Grandma died. He had been a nice dog, even if he didn't talk to her. She kind of missed him. Katie turned her head and saw Mr. P getting off the bus. She saw Jackson, or he saw Jackson Jones, and broke stride, then continued slowly, carrying his jacket because it was hot out. She bet that he didn't intend on paying Jackson today either if he could help it. Did he keep the boy coming time and time again after his money just to be mean? She decided that he was mean enough to do just that. They met at the edge of the parking lot, just a few yards away from Katie's balcony. She could look down and see Mr. P's bald head, the strand of hair combed across it askew, and the wallet in his back pocket. Katie's fingers curled around the railing. Could she work that wallet out of his tight pocket? Can I collect today, sir? Jackson asked, as politely as if he hadn't already tried several times before. Gee, um, I don't think I've got anything smaller than a 20, Mr. P said. I'll look and see, but I'm pretty sure I don't. He seemed surprised when the wallet almost jumped out of the pocket into his hand, and then he opened it up to look. Katie closed her eyes and gritted her teeth, and then looked to see how it was going. The wallet seemed to wriggle in Mr. P's fingers, almost as if it were alive. Probably he had intended to just pretend to look into the compartment, but instead he suddenly found money sliding out past his fingers, moving with a will of their own. The money eluded his grasp and went sailing off in several directions. Mr. P yelped and grabbed, almost falling over his feet. 
One bill blew right against Jackson Jones' shirt and stuck there until he put a hand over it. Oh, hey, this one's a ten, Mr. Pollard, Jackson said. I can make change for that. Mr. Pollard, however, wasn't listening. He was chasing his money. One bill skidded merrily across the sidewalk, defying his efforts to step on it, and another got stuck in a tree branch, blending in with the leaves. Yet a third wafted to the feet of a man who had been looking for the apartment just as he came out of the front door. Hey, what's going on? The man picked up the bill and looked at it, and then spotted its twin in the tree. Whose money is this? Yours? he asked Jackson Jones. Jackson was busily writing out a receipt. Well, part of it's mine to pay for the paper. The rest of it belongs to him, and he gestured to Mr. Pollard, who had finally managed to capture the last of his bills and was cautiously pulling it from under his foot. Mr. Pollard was red-faced and sweating when he came back and accepted Jackson's receipt. He looked up and saw Katie, and his face got even redder. Funny, he said to no one in particular, how that kid is always around when things go flying. What was that? the new man said. Mr. P. muttered something that Katie didn't understand. She didn't think the other man understood either. My name's Cooper, the man said. Adam Cooper. I've just rented apartment 2C. Are you one of my neighbors? Hal Pollard, 3A, Mr. Pollard told him, accepting the money that Mr. Cooper handed to him. Thanks. I hope we got it all. What happened? The wind? I guess. Excuse me, I'm going to go take a swim before supper. It must be 95 out in the shade today. Well, at least someone was going to use the pool. Katie wasn't sure that she wanted to share it with no one but Mr. P, though. Jackson Jones called out, Thanks, Mr. Pollard, and then looked up at Katie and smiled. See ya, he told her. Adam Cooper still stood below her. Hi again, he said. Listen, are you busy, young lady, or could you help me haul things in tomorrow morning when I bring my stuff over? I'll pay you. Katie shrugged. Sure, why not? Are you going to swim in the pool? Not tonight, he said. Maybe tomorrow. Why, do you need a lifeguard? Somebody other than Mr. Pollard, Katie said. You don't like him? Adam Cooper asked. I don't think anyone likes Mr. Pollard, Katie told him. He kicks cats, and he doesn't pay his bills, and he always tells lies and swears at people even when they didn't do anything. Is that right, the man said. Well, he sounds like a winner. Tell you what, after we get my stuff carried in tomorrow, we'll go swimming, okay? Okay, Katie said. And then, after she had gone back in the apartment, she wondered uneasily if her mother would agree to that, or if the new tenant fell into the category of strange men to be treated warily. No sooner, though, had she gotten inside than that thought was out of her mind, and she smelled the meatloaf and potatoes. Oh, no. She'd burned up their supper. Katie jerked open the oven door, and the smoke poured out into the room, just as Monica put the key into the lock. And that is where we're going to end it with burned dinner. I don't, I, I have definitely burned several dinners. Not usually because of that. Usually because I slopped onto the burner in the stove. But, um, yeah, that's embarrassing. <laughs> but maybe she can just blame it on the babysitter. That'll work. She didn't like that lady anyway. So what do we think of uh, of this new man, and what do we think of Mrs. M and being so accepting? I do think it's funny that um, she said that the older you get, the more accepting you get. And maybe if you had a flexible mind to begin with, but sometimes I think, I think it was Stephen King that said that people don't really change. They just become more of what they were meant to be from the very beginning or something along those lines. I'm paraphrasing, but I think he said that in the author's notes in maybe Graveyard Shift or Night Shift. 
I'm not sure. Silly thought. Um, anyway, I hope you are enjoying the story. And, uh, yeah, let me know if you like it. I mean, I'm going to finish it no matter what. It's, it is definitely one of my favorites, but it, it makes me happy to know that other people are enjoying the stories as well. So, anyway, I have rambled on enough. This is a little bit shorter than the last couple, but I, I feel like it's a decent length. So, anyway, let me know what you think, or don't, that's fine too, and I will see you tomorrow.